to everyone. Could I ask you please to turn your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 3? If you didn't bring your Bible, that's okay. You can just listen as the verses are read. James, chapter 3. I just want to return to a theme that has very much stirred my heart over the years, and that is the wisdom of God. Wisdom of God. The other day I was in my car, and it was one of those very hot days, hot, humid days, and I just, I had a bit of time on my hands before I had to be somewhere. So I pulled off to the side of the road, turned the car off, and I got my Bible out and was reading a few verses. But it just got so hot in the car, it was silly for me to, to be there in such a hot car with the windows up. So I just put the power of the car on so that I could roll the windows down. But as soon as I turned the power on, the, the air from the air conditioner, there was a, a blast or a puff of air from that air conditioner just came and hit me right in the face. And it was just beautiful. Just, just almost instantly, just boom, boom, uh, beautiful fresh air. And you know, sometimes when I read... God's Word, it's like that breath of fresh air that comes and, and hits me. For example, when I read John, uh, sorry, James chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure. Here is a breath of fresh air from God's Word to us. The wisdom from above. Father, as we speak about you, Lord, we are mindful of our great need of you. Lord, who can stand in this place and speak of you, speak of your nature? Lord, uh, there is none more uh, unworthy than myself or un unable as myself. So, Father, I look to you. I join my prayers with uh, each one here to ask, Lord, that you would speak your word to each of our hearts. Lord, we've come to, to hear from you, Lord, for, to hear from your word, so that you yourself, Lord, would receive all the glory, and your people that are gathered here today would be edified and built up. Lord, we know that there, there can be no good thing happen here today, except by you through your Holy Spirit. So we commit ourselves to you, each one, pray that we'd be able to speak and we'd be able to hear from you this morning. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our theme is the wisdom from above. Now when it says from above, that of course means from heaven. From God. From God the Father. This is, this is where wisdom comes from. This is where it originates. As James tells us actually early in his letter, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, comes down from the Father of lights. And so it is true of wisdom, because wisdom is something that God has within himself always for all of eternity. It's, it's something that he himself possesses. And we can say, only God has this wisdom. Now we know from, from Scripture that this, uh, this wisdom, which is within God, which is in Within him, first of all, it's true wisdom. It's the truth. It's, wisdom is, very, is one of those attributes of God. And so when we speak about wisdom, we're speaking about something in the heart of God, in the nature of God, the attribute of God. Something which he himself possesses. But also, praise God, it's something that he gives. That he gives. You see, that wisdom that comes down from above, it doesn't stay in heaven. No, it comes down. It comes down and enters the heart. So he gives it to his children, this wisdom. And can I say also at the outset, this is something that we desperately need. We, we so need especially in the times in which we live, in the world, the, the way it is and the way it's going, and the thoughts and the philosophies and the ways of this world are, 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 have got so far astray 
in so many crazy, confused directions. We desperately need this wisdom from God, this wisdom that comes down from above. Now, as I contemplated this message, it became very clear to me quickly that as, as I talk about wi wisdom, I'll have to talk about how it's linked with humility. There's this close association with wisdom, this wisdom from above, and humility. And secondly, the thing I noticed is that it, the close association with wisdom and peace. So we're going to talk about wisdom from God, the very nature of God. We're going to talk about humility. We're going to talk about peace. And so obviously we need the Lord's help to do all of that. Now, to understand something better, we need to consider its opposite. This is something that I've said before. We want to consider something and understand it better. Stop and consider its opposite, and then you'll get a better understanding of that. We see in Scripture contrasts everywhere. As if these, if these two opposing things are held up before us uh, by way of a contrast so that we can understand them both better as they relate to one another in this opposite way. And that's what we have here in James 3, contrasts. So it's not just James 3.17 I want to focus on. Let's look at the passage beginning from verse 13 to verse 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this morning. But just look at the contrasts that are here presented to us. And the first, the obvious one is there's, there's wisdom that's not from above, and there's wisdom from above. One, we can say, is so-called wisdom. It's, it's false wisdom. It's a counterfeit wisdom, as, as opposed to this true wisdom coming down from heaven. So this one we might say is true, it's coming down from heaven. This other wisdom comes up from hell, as somebody put it. So we have that contrast here in these verses. We also see that if you notice it, there's the contrast here between humility and pride. Arrogance. That pride, that, that evil which bedevils this entire human race, which runs through the human race like a poison and causes so much damage. And as how, how clear are the scriptures? God opposes the proud. It tells us in this very book of James. He repeats it. But he gives grace to the humble. So we have this contrast, humility and pride. We also have the contrast here in our verses between uh, peace and, and the opposite. Now, what would you say would be the opposite of peace? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, that probably... There could be a lot of words which could set themselves up in opposition to peace. Those very things that are mentioned. I want, to, I want to suggest from our passage here, the opposite of peace is disorder. You see it there in verse 6. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder. Now I want to set that up as, as in opposition to peace. Um, but there are many words we could use. We've got peace here, and, and the opposite is or disorder, confusion, restlessness, insecurity, confusion, chaos, commotion, 
You get the picture. Now let's just focus on this passage in front of us. First of all, he begins with a question. Uh, and maybe we should just pose that question to the congregation. What's the question? Uh, well, who, who among you is wise and understanding? Okay. James said, who is wise and understanding among you? Okay. But look, look what he says next. Let him show it. Let him show it. You see, James, in his, in his fashion, is always the practical one. He brings, he brings the great truth of Scripture down to earth. His writing is very practical. He says, look, if anybody is, is wise and understanding, let him show it by his actions. That's what he says here. By his good behavior. Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Just note that word, the gentleness of wisdom. But, you know, James, as I said in his fashion, is to say if, 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 if somebody says they're wise, let them let, it should be seen, it should be evident in their life, in their behavior, in their deeds. It reminds us of faith, doesn't it? Chapter before this, James talks about faith. It must be accompanied by works. And if there is faith, there will be good works. And so in a similar way, if there's wisdom, if somebody has this wisdom that comes down from above, it's going to be seen in their life, in their behavior. It's going to be seen in the gentleness of wisdom. So this is what James says to us. Gentleness of wisdom. Now by contrast to that, we have these two things that he brings to us. One, bitter jealousy. That is envy. And secondly, selfish ambition. Or, or strife. Uh, that type of ambition which seeks to get ahead for self, for self uh, glory, it, it's a self-seeking. That's why he says selfish ambition, striving. Uh, back in uh, ancient times, Aristotle said that this word was often applied to, applied to the politicians of, of that day who were actually in it just for themselves and for their own glory and their own uh, self-respect um, and so forth. Uh, I'm sure that could only be applied to the politicians of Aristotle's day. I'm sure it doesn't apply to politicians of, of our own day in any way. Um, but these two things, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, and can I say these things are self-perpetuating? That means they tend to multiply. They tend to um, reproduce themselves. Because what often d does bitter jealousy lead to but more jealousy, more envy? What does selfish ambition lead to but more of the same? It, it goes on and on in this um, resulting in just more of the same thing. Notice that James says, if you have these things in your heart, in your heart, he says, do not be arrogant. In other words, don't, don't go around boasting that you're wise, that you have this wisdom. Don't, he said, do not boast, don't, do not be arrogant, and so lie against the truth. You know, you, you may say you have wisdom, and other people may call you a very wise person. But if these things are in your heart, you're just lying against the truth. Your whole, your whole life is a lie. He says, why? Because this wisdom, this false, this counterfeit wisdom, is not that which comes down from above. And then he says three things. This wisdom, he says, first of all, is earthly. It's earthbound. It's only caught up and concerned with this earth that we occupy, that we're living upon. You can't see, can't see anything beyond that. So no thought of heavenly things. It's earthly. It's earth-bound. Uh, as somebody said, a person such as this can't see past their own nose. Secondly, he said it's natural. That means it's not spiritual, unspiritual. Okay? Natural is supposed to be spiritual. Um, we talk about the natural man, the natural person, the unregenerate. Okay? The, the un unregenerate person's wisdom is, is, is this very type of wisdom. It's not that which comes down from above. That, it's not spiritual. It's natural, James says. And it gets worse. He goes on to say it's demonic. It's demonic. It's demon-like. It's from hell. 
And then he says the result of such things, this, this earthly, natural, demonic wisdom, the re result of that is disorder. Disorder. That's why I want to put disorder as an oppos opposite of peace. But he says it's disorder and every evil thing. And, and I, I believe in the context of James where he's coming from, part of these evil things is division, factions, enmity, such things that separate people into parties, if you like, you know. But then we have that beautiful word in Scripture, but. James says, but the wisdom from above. Verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure. So note the contrast. We've just been exposed to this uh, false, earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. And now, here's the breath of fresh air coming to us. The wisdom that's from above. When it says above, it's telling us where it originates. In God himself. You know, Job's cry, in his anguish, in his pain, you don't need to turn to it. I'll just flip over quickly to Job uh, chapter 28. In the midst of all that pain, you know, what, he, what Job needed was wisdom. He needed to be able to see into the very heart of things and what was going on to try to make some kind of sense out of all because he was in a terrible state, not only of physical pain and not only from his friends telling him what a sinner he was, but, but he, he, he was in confusion. Everything had been falling apart around him and he cries out in, verse, in chapter 28, where can wisdom be found? I believe it's a cry of anguish from a man, a man who is desperate. Where can wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value and so he goes on. He says we can dig down deep for gold. We can, we can sink shafts deep into the, to the ground and we can excavate gold and we can find silver and precious jewels. But where is wisdom found? He cries. And then he says these words, perhaps more calmly. God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the end of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. God knows. His wisdom is his. Now let's look at this list that James presents, and what a list it is of this wisdom that comes down from above. And there, there, there seems to be something of an order here, at least for the first two. I think after that, I think everything else kind of flows after the first two. But James says this wisdom from above is first pure. So if he puts it first, we must put it first. It's first pure. Now this word pure has the same uh, root, is, is the same root word as hagios, holy, holy. So what he's talking about here is moral purity. Moral purity. It's unmixed. It's uncontaminated. It's completely pure. James says this is first of all. Now I just want to ask you, how many things are there in this life that you can apply this word pure to? Just think about it for a moment. How many things can we say are pure? What, what human virtues, human characteristics, qualities are 100% pure? Hmm. What experiences do you go through in life that are completely pure? What motives of the heart are completely pure? This is where it gets deeper because what does God look at? He looks at the heart and he sees the motives. Which of, which of us can here say all of our motives are always pure? Clean. I don't know, I like to think of things. I, I, I thought of the water. Ma imagine water being completely pure. Now, no, no contaminations, no chemicals, nothing mixed in it, just pure water. Now imagine yourself very parched, parched and thirsty on a hot day. Your, your mouth is dry and you're 
ever so thirsty. And you're, and you're brought to a place where, where, where water is flowing way up high from the snow-capped mountaintops and it's flowing down. Imagine this water is completely pure. There's nothing in it mixed up with it in any way. And you're just brought and you're thirsty and you, and you scoop it up and you bring it to your mouth. And you're drinking this pure water. Oh. I dare say you would never forget that experience the rest of your life. You probably date everything in your life to before and after that experience. Oh, such and such happened before I had that pure water. And this happened 10 years after I had that pure water. It would be such an experience, but nobody's ever had that experience because nobody's ever had completely pure water. So this wisdom that comes down from above, God's wisdom is uncontaminated. In fact, you can say, if it is mixed with anything else, it's no longer wisdom from above. What a terrible thing is this mixture. Just often reflect upon this. Mixture is a terrible thing. And to understand that, just think of food. Think of the ingredients of food. Maybe 95% of it is good. But, but what if it's mixed in with some harmful chemicals? Or what if it's 99% good, but it's 1% poison? Do you want to eat that food? Oh, it's 99% good. Yes, but it's 1% rat poison. Who, who would want to partake of that? Or just think of human beings. Think of the mixture in human beings. A man I admire named Pascal. Pascal is, um, I suppose, many things to, to, to many people. When you say the name Pascal, some people think of he's a great mathematician, which he was. He's the father of the theory of probability. Some people think of him as a scientist, which he was. Some people think of him as an inventor. Some people think of him as a Christian thinker because he, he actually has a famous book in which he wrote down his thoughts, his reflections. Um, but, you know, this, I, I mention him because he, he, it seems to me, more than anybody else, really captures that mixture which is in every single human being. So he says, on the one hand, we're, we're, we're capable of high and lofty thoughts and great uh, feats of the intellect and great accomplishments and, and, we're, and we're like the angels and on another, and another hand we're, we're, we're just like we're so base and we're just like the animals you know and he didn't say this I say this you know, sometimes human beings are, are worse than any animal and what human beings do to each other is, is worse than what any animal but he says these things exist this, this high and this low and he, he seemed to face this terrible mixture God came to deal with that, but the wisdom from above is first pure. It's first pure. Then, it says, then, peaceable. Peaceable. Peaceful. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And it's one of those big, wonderful, great, great Hebrew words to, to study. It, 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 it refers to wholeness. Wholeness. Well-being, order, order as opposed to disorder, okay? So, so the one who, this wisdom from above, the one who has received this wisdom from above is peace, peaceful, peaceable. He, the one tends to promote the well-being, the wholeness of those around. So as I said, wisdom is, this wisdom from above is linked with peace. I'll come back to this idea of peace in a moment. But let's continue going through the list. It says, then gentle. Gentle. It's a different word for gentle than we saw earlier in the previous verse, gentle. But, but it speaks of meekness. Okay? Mild, meek, patient, moderate, humble. Humble. This wisdom from above is humble. Next word it says is reasonable. Reasonable. You might have different translations. I think the King James has this word as easy to be entreated. Easy to be entreated. Now, I've got a picture in my mind of what this means. A person who has this wisdom from above is reasonable, is approachable, is willing to, to comply, willing to listen. There's a willingness. As opposed to, now, I know I'm right, you're wrong, I'm not even going to listen to what you have to say. 
I'm not even going to consider. Don't, don't even talk to me. I mean, people don't put it that way, but, it, but everything about them says, I, I really don't want to listen to what you're going to say at all. I don't want to listen to your point of view. I don't, want to, I don't want to know where you're coming from. I'm quite set in my ways, and I know my ways are right. You know, what, what are you going on about this? That's the opposite of what we have here. Someone who has this wisdom from above is reasonable, willing to listen, and actually willing to give in if, if the circumstances call for that. Not to be so stubborn and so set in their ways that they, they won't even listen to anybody else's point of view. Reminds me of a scene from Fiddler on the Roof. You, you remember that great play? There was a time there when uh, the, uh, main, the main person in the story, uh, this Jewish man in this crowd of people, and one, one comes along and makes a statement. And he listens to what the man says and he says, mm, you are right. And then somebody else comes along and actually disagrees with that, and he, and he, he makes a statement contrary to the first statement, and, and the, the character says, mm, you know, you are right. Now the third person says, what are you talking about? He can't be right. He said he's right and he's right. They can't both be right. He looks at him and says, you know, you are also right. <laughs> but are you willing to listen to different sides, different points of view? This is one of the characteristics of this wisdom, and I believe a very important one. The list goes on. It says, full of mercy. This wisdom from above, this wisdom from God that comes down to the human heart is full of mercy. Now, let me just pause here for a moment. And so, what we're talking, what James is talking about here is not an intellectual thing in the first instance. I mean, you might think of a wise person as a super intellect, like an Einstein. We might attach wisdom to, to those people with great powers of mind. Einstein, Pascal, Isaac Newton, and so on and so forth. But that's not James, his heart. He, it's not a matter of the intellect. It's a matter of the heart. And, and I know that because he says, this one is full of mercy. Full of mercy. See, God... God himself is rich in mercy, in kindness. That, again, that Hebrew word chesed, loving kindness, the mercy of God. Now I want to say this, and keep this in mind. Mercy assumes need on the part of the one who receives it, and it assumes resources adequate to meet that need on the part of the one who shows it. This is the very nature of the mercy of God. It assumes need on the one who receives it and adequate resources on the part of the one who shows it. So earlier in his letter, James says, don't talk to me about religion. This is religion to visit the widows and the orphans. In other words, visit those in need. And by, God, by God's grace, if you have that which can, can help alleviate the suffering of such widows and orphans, then show mercy. You have that which can meet the needs of another human being. And this wisdom from above is full of, of mercy. Maybe, it, maybe the need is for forgiveness. You know, some, somebody who is just uh, bound in unforgiveness, well, that person doesn't have the wisdom of God from above flowing into their hearts because there, there will be a willingness to forgive. The willingness to give practical help. Why? Because such a one is merciful. Now, since God is merciful to us, he would have us to be merciful to others and to each other. To be merciful to each other. This leads to peace. In fact, you might be able to trace this in Scripture. First, grace, and leading to mercy, leading to the result of peace. Not only is it full of mercy, but it's also full of good fruits. So this wisdom from above is not alone. It's full of mercy. It's full of good fruits. Think of a tree laden with luscious, juicy fruit. This is what the wisdom from above is full. Full of good fruits. So it, in the list, it talked about things that the wisdom from above is, but there's a couple things that, which it doesn't have. Now, the next word is debated as far as what does it mean. Maybe our brother... Uh, Brothers who are more expert in the Greek language can have it help us. But um, after it says full of mercy and good fruits, my, my translation says unwavering, unwavering. Okay? 
doesn't go back and forth, back and forth. Um, another another uh, translation says, without partiality. Uh, it's, just not, it's not a respect of persons. That's, of course, ex consistent with what James said earlier. Do not show partiality. If someone comes into our church through that door wearing a nice, beautiful suit and gold ring, and we say, oh, come, come here. It's so good you can join us. Uh, sit here in this, in this good place. And somebody walks in through that door, shabby and torn clothes and poor, obviously been living on the street, um, hadn't had a good shower or a good meal, and we say, I'll oh, just... I don't know, sit back there somewhere or, you know, just... James says, don't do it. You're showing partiality. After the service is over, when we have fellowship with one another, uh, there are those in the church, no doubt, family that we are closer with because we just know them better. We have friendships. Do we always go and mingle with those who are, have a close friendship? Or do we go and seek out someone that, to talk to that we perhaps don't know that well? Uh, that maybe is not talking to anybody, that maybe we can get to know better. And last of all, in this list, it says it's without hypocrisy. The wisdom from above is without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, when you stop and reflect, is something which is universally condemned. It doesn't matter who you are, what you believe. It seems like everybody condemns hypocrisy. Nobody, nobody wants to put up with a hypocrite. And yet, you know, it's something that we see too easily in others. We're very quick and very um, um, easy, easy to see in others, but we're so slow to see it in ourselves. In fact, I was just thinking this morning how this is a, this is a um, criticism that's often leveled against Christians. Oh, you're hypocrites. And yet the very person who says that is just often blind, completely blind to the hypocrisy in their own lives. But anyway, this wisdom is without hypocrisy. It wears no masks. It's not pretentious. It's, it's not trying to be something. It's, not, it's try, not trying to impress anybody. It's not putting on airs. It's sincere. That's, that's a good word to, to uh, understand. It's sincere. It's not fake. It's real. The yes is yes and it's no is no. It's, not, it's no double talk. And it's not double minded. There's no ul ulterior motives. No hidden agenda. You get the idea. Well, that's the picture that James gives us of the wisdom that's from above. And what an incredible picture it is. It's the wisdom that comes down from God to us. And James, in a sense, is saying, the person who's received that wisdom from above, well, this is what they're going to look like. This is what it looks like. But there's another verse. Just look quickly at verse 18. It seems in some ways to stand on its own. It doesn't seem necessarily to flow from the verses that have gone before, but it does fit in very well. Not only does it fit in with the context, but it actually the context of the whole Bible. And it isn't amazing how the Bible can say so much to bring so much together in just one verse. Look at verse 18. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So there's a seed. We're out in the field now. We're farmers. We're all farmers now, and we're, we're planting seed. And the seed, what's the harvest? What's going to come of it? Righteousness. This righteousness, is, is, I don't think it's talking about that which is imputed to us by faith in Christ. It's talking about growing in Christ-likeness. If you like, progressive sanctification. This is the righteous, righteous living, righteous acts. So the seed whose fruit is this, is this righteousness is sown in peace. It's not sown in disorder. It's not sown in restlessness, chaos and confusion. It's sown in peace by those who make peace. Actually, it could be, again, in the Greek. Let's all go home and study Greek, yeah? Don't put everything else away. Everything else you're doing is studying, and just don't do anything else but study Greek. All right. Um, because this verse, could, it could be either it's um, is by those who make peace or for those who make peace. It doesn't matter. It's all peace. Peace from beginning to end. Peace is the result. Peace reproduces itself. You see, filled with wisdom from above, 
We are to sow a seed in peace, not in restless disorder and confusion. Peace is needed. You know, in, um, in Luke 10, let me just turn over to it uh, quickly. Luke 10, verses 5 and 6. This is when Jesus sent out the people. In this case, it was actually he was sending out the 70 to go from town to town, to place to place, village to village. But in Luke 10, verse 5 says, Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. What an amazing thing. That if you are a person of peace, if you have the peace of God in here in your heart, you, you can actually make peace. Your peace can rest on a household. As soon as you enter into it, why do why did the, the Jewish people, when they enter a house, say shalom? When our brother Jenny comes over for Bible study, it's the first thing he says when he comes into our house, shalom. He's giving it our house his blessing of peace. And, and brother, I hope, I hope that peace stays in the house. But um, peace, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers with wisdom from above and the resulting peace. We are to sow seeds in peace. God is a God of peace. And he speaks to those, he speaks peace to those who are hearts. I can't resist re reading another verse. This one is from Isaiah 32, uh, just because of the beauty of it. And I think it fits our context. Isaiah 32 Verse 17, talking about the blessings of God's people to come. Um, let me go back to 16. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field. And the work of righteousness will be peace. And the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. This is what should permeate our lives. This is what we are to go about sowing our seeds in this, in this quietness and confidence of peace. Well, I just want to now just summarize and just make a few final thoughts and applications. So I've got five reflections to end with. And then I close. Number one, wisdom is God's. It is His. God's wisdom is so deep so great. Who could even begin to fathom the wisdom of God? It's His. It's His possession. But it's given to us when we ask. Isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't the Bible somehow disarmingly simple? If any of you, James says, lacks wisdom, let him ask. Why? Because God is willing, desiring to give wisdom. But James says, ask in faith. So we must ask believing for this. Number two, and I go to the book of Proverbs now. The, the book of Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So that this real wisdom, this true wisdom from above, must be revealed from, from God in heaven, and it requires reverence for God and a humble spirit to receive it. Number three. This wisdom is opposed to pride. Pride, self-seeking, self-glory. You know, each one, each human being so desires so much desires to have the praise of others. If we really search our hearts, if we're honest with ourselves, I think every single person will be able to detect that as a desire for the praise of others. Preachers have that desire. They, they, they want people to say, oh, what a great sermon, brother. You know, don't, don't be like the preacher who preached a, a sermon on humility. And afterwards, you know, he's you know, I'm really proud of that sermon on humility. You know, it's a pretty, pretty good sermon. I'm very proud of it. No, no, no. But each one of us desires the praise of others, the respect. We want to be highly thought of. But, but this wisdom from, uh, from above is humble. 
is humble. Number four, we, we, we must not be so set in our ways, as I said before, too dogmatic even in doctrine. That doesn't mean we are to hold the essentials of the faith and what we believe from God's word and we stand. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we, we are to avoid this scenario, to be correct in our doctrine, in our teaching, but not, but not speaking it with wisdom from above. We, we, we will be undoing the good that we are doing because the words we might be saying are true and right, but if we're not saying them in the right way with the wisdom from above, You know, this, this wisdom from above, it listens to others. And I want to say that not many of us are good listeners. And when I say us, I just mean people in general. Pe people generally are, are not good listeners. You know when you find one. When you find a good listener. But I, I have to say honestly, in my lifetime, I haven't found many good listeners. You know, oftentimes people actually don't listen to what you say at all. They, they cut you off kind of mid-sentence because they're so anxious to, to, to kind of respond. Before you even have a chance to finish, they're actually speaking. So and you think, oh, didn't actually really listen to what I had to say. And aren't we all guilty of that? We're listening to somebody, even before they finish, we, we want to jump in and, and maybe correct them or maybe respond to them. So, sometimes people say something even by way of a question. And they won't even kind of stick around for an answer. They raise the question and you start to, and they're gone. We're not very good listeners. But this wisdom from above is not out to win arguments, but to win souls for the truth. The truth is the thing. Not, not, not anything. People can, the, the person who has this wisdom from above, they can take criticism, they can take opposition. They're not going to be... Uh, kind of lashing out back uh, trying to give it back give criticism again in turn they're not going to be condemning rebuking yes because there is a time when rebuke is needed but rebuke gently rebuking gently and I think now it's appropriate to read 2 Timothy to Timothy uh, chapter 2 uh, verse 4 I can find it just before Hebrews 2 Timothy 2, chapter 4. I, I, I've, I've turned it because I feel it's important to read this. It says, the, oh, sorry, verse 24. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. This, this just gels so well with what James is saying about the one with wisdom from above. It's going to be gentle. It's going to be patient. It's going to be willing to listen. It's not going to be quarrelsome, but in gentleness, instructing, teaching. Not, not to win the argument, to win the person. You understand? It's going to speak graciously, humbly, gently. Five last I'll just repeat, it's a matter of the heart first. It's a matter of humility. It's not a matter of just imparting knowledge, facts, information, but to, to, to lead others to a more Christ-like walk. True wisdom leads to humility and peace and peacemaking. So in closing, I just feel to remind you of a couple things, and we, we've got a couple more minutes. So, All this was at a time when the people that were greatly looked up to, go, go back into the Greco-Roman world, and who was looked up to? The philosophers. The, these ones, and some of them actually went around, uh, going around from place to place in speaking, and some of them had tremendous powers of speech. They were ever so eloquent so that they were able to, to go as they went around and maybe to a public place, a, a pl plaza, and stand up on a platform or something and speak, and pretty soon a whole crowd was gathering around them, and more and more, and they were just holding the whole crowd spellbound with the power of their words. And this was highly looked up to at that time. 
And the people would have been saying afterwards, not necessarily what was the substance, what, what was true about this man saying, but they were saying, oh, what wisdom. Because he expressed himself so powerfully, so wonderfully. What wisdom this person has. Meanwhile, the person, the philosopher, was drinking in, loving all that praise. Yes. You know, wanting that praise. Wanting to be thought of as a wise. Probably nothing higher in those days to be thought of a, of a wise philosopher. Oh, here's another Plato, another Socrates, another Aristotle. But what was going inside the person's heart? We don't know. He's probably, probably jealous of that other philosopher who met here before, and he had a bit of a bigger crowd. He's got this bitter jealousy. The crowd applauded more for that speaker. Or even worse, a, a humble Christian person of Christian faith comes and wants to speak to him. And, and from his high position, he looks down and, and, and doesn't even want to speak to this Christian about, who wants to talk to him about a, a, a crucified Christ as Savior of the world. <laughs> this, this, this philosopher, I, I, I'm not going to waste my precious time on that. You know, I'll smile, I'll pat this one on the head, you know. You, you go your way, you know, this, and he thinks of this foolish person. But, but I, I'm, I'm above all that. I'm too good to, to, to lower myself to talk about, you know, a Jewish man nailed to a cross. <laughs> Get away from me. Or, or, he, or he doesn't have time to visit orphans and widow, widows. He's too busy. He's going around preaching to the crowds and about whatever. I, I, can, I can't see widows. I can't see orphans. Uh, and he, or he might have anything going on in his heart. Unforgiveness, bitterness, ambition. He wants, the, he wants the praise of people and respect of people. And James is writing at a time when all these things were highly thought of. I just wanted to stress that. It was a time of great show and great display of boasting and ostentation. But compare Jesus' example. People at those times were looking for a crown, maybe in the Olympics crown, or as I said, the crown of philosophy, a wreath. Jesus was looking for a towel to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus took on the role of a servant. Jesus more than one time said, what, what would you have me do? This is a servant speaking. What would you have me do? I'm going to really risk testing your patience now. But I was going to give a little picture of uh, the two people, one person with wisdom from above and the other person from wisdom not from above. And I tried to paint the picture, but I came across this. So let me read it to you in our closing prayer because this person says it much better than I do. Portrait of two men. Try to think of these two people. First of all, let's consider the, the, the truly wise man, the one who has the wisdom from above. This man is truly wise Oh, sorry, the man who's truly wise is genuinely humble. He estimates others to be better than himself. He does not put on airs, but does, does put others at ease right away. His behavior is not like the world around him. It seems otherworldly. He does not live for the body, but for the spirit. In words and deeds, he makes you think of the Lord Jesus. His life is pure. Morally and spiritually, he is clean. He is peaceable. He will endure insult and false accusation, but will not fight back, even seek to justify himself. He is gentle, mild-mannered, tender-hearted. He is easy to reason with, willing to try to see the other pers person's point of view. He is not vindictive, but always ready to forgive those who have wronged him. Not only this, but he habitually shows kindness to others, especially to, to those who don't deserve it. And he is the same to all. He plays no favorites. The rich receive the same treatment as the poor. The great are not preferred above the common people. Finally, he is not a hypocrite. He doesn't say one thing and mean another. You'll never find him flatter anyone. He, just, he speaks the truth and never wears a mask. That's one portrait. Now consider the portrait of, the, of this other wisdom that's not from above. His heart is filled with envy and strife. In his determination to enrich himself, he becomes intolerant of every trivial competitor, rival or competitor. There's nothing noble about his behavior. It rises no higher than the earth. He lives to gratify, gratify his natural appetites, just as the animals do. 
and his methods are cruel, treacherous, and devilish. Beneath his well-pressed suit is a life of impurity. His thought life is polluted. His morals debased, his speech unclean. He is quarrelsome with all those who disagree with him or cross, cross him in any way. At home, at work, in social life, he is constantly contentious. He is harsh and overbearing, rude and crude. People cannot approach him easily. He keeps them at arm's length. To reason with him quietly is all but impossible. His mind is already made up, and his opinions are not subject to change. Thank you very much. He is unforgiving and vindictive. When he catches someone in a fault or an error, he shows no mercy. Rather, he unleashes a torrent of abuse, discourtesy, and meanness. He values people according to the benefit they might give, give to him. He's two-faced and insecure, and on and on it goes. A portrait of the one who has this wisdom from above and the one who has this wisdom from hell. May we be delivered from that hellish demonic wisdom from below and walk in the wisdom which is from above. And thus, may we become in his eyes as those who find and make peace. Father, thank you. Bless your word to our hearts. Lord, may we be true servants of the, of the Lord and of his gospel. Not quarrelsome. Not ready to jump all over somebody who we think is wrong, but be gentle. Lord, not even um, thinking that we're always so right that we refuse to listen to others. Lord, forgive us when we are guilty of such things. Father, ever give us this wisdom from above, flowing down from your throne, from your very heart to our heart. And uh, Father, I pray this for every one of us as we go out this week into our homes, Father, to, to care for our workplaces, our schools, our universities, our neighborhoods, all these different spheres of, of work. May we be those who stand out who shine because we have received wisdom from above. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name.